to the Print Soft Cover. Today, we are joined by two guests, Stephen Barker and Santya Marik. Stephen Barker is a historian and an independent museum consultant. He is the author of the book that we will be discussing today, Ryan of the Skies, Hardit Singh Marik, The Royal Air Force and the First World War. It is a HarperCollins publication. Santya Marik is the granddaughter of Hardit Singh Marik, on whom the book is based on. Thank you so much for joining us at the print. Thank you for the invitation. Um, just going to quickly unveil the book before we move forward. They have it wrapped up here for us. Take a brief few seconds. Here we have it. Here's the book. Fantastic. So um, I just uh, recently read the book and sort of uh, a few thoughts came to my mind, which is specifically that I feel that there were like two clear levels to the book. At one level, the book uncovers and brings to a wider audience the inspirational story of Hardit Singh Marik, who was the first Sikh to fly for the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Air Force during World War I. And then after was it, and then once India gained independence, he served as a distinguished diplomat for India. With fantastic archival work and research, Stephen unpacks Hardit Singh Marik's story from Rawalpindi in Pakistan to Bagel College at Oxford, his struggles to enlist in the RFC, while also bringing to right Hardit Singh Marik's service during World War I. However, at the second level, I feel that the book plays an essential role in giving recognition and agency to the rule of Indians and those from the erstwhile colonies who served for Britain during World War I. Their contribution until recently has been ignored in literature and scholarship. And over the last decade or two, there has been a change in trend in giving them more recognition and studying their contribution further. With this book, Stephen pushes the needle forward on this aspect of the literature. Um, so I'd like to begin by asking you, Stephen specifically, how did the idea of this book come about? Uh, in the book, you allude to events at a school in Warwick in 2018. Is that where the process began? Um, no, that came a little bit later. Um, I came across Hardit Singh's story uh, about 10 years ago, probably just after the publication of his autobiography. And because of his association with Balliol College in Oxford, I wanted to use that story um, to explain a more diversified war than is often known in Great Britain. And as a result of that, I included Hardit Singh's story in exhibitions to do with the First World War during the First World War centenary. That lovely moment though that you described where um, the grandson of an RAF pilot who'd fought in the First World War, been in the same squadron as Hardit Singh, brought forward an album. And um, as I say in the book, I'm very cynical about recognizing soldiers from a hundred years ago. It's a fool's errand, but in this case, my colleague who brought that album to my attention, there was no doubt that was Hardit Singh Malik. And uh, that was a joy. And that particular occasion was the trigger for me to, to do something that I'd had in mind for a long time, which was that having read the autobiography, I knew that there was a wider story and that proved to be true. Um, Santia, specifically, I'd like to ask you, how and when did you get involved with the book? And how does it feel to have this biography out now, uh, which is now hopefully going to be read by many people? Uh, I hope so. I think I first um, learned of Stephen's work. Um, Stephen, you contacted me, yes, I think through through my aunt, uh, Adit yes. Singh's uh, niece, Vinita Tripathi. And uh, because a, a colleague, a uh, historian, writer, a uh, colleague of, of Stevens, Shrabani Basu, had written uh, a wonderful work about uh, the Indian contribution in such enormous numbers to the Great War, um, which I think was a very little known fact at the time. Um, and I think it's through these two connections that uh, Stephen and I were put in, in contact. And then we had uh, several interesting uh, discussions uh, and talks uh, as time unfolded. Uh, I think my only real involvement 
was to go through the um, uh, family photographs, the archival photographs we had um, that I was aware of, my aunt just having passed away. So I had all the papers and photographs that I was actually sorting through, uh, it, you know, very dusty, very old, but fascinating pictures uh, going back to, you know, the late 1800s, which is quite incredible to have in your hands. And as I was aware that these pictures existed, then I started looking in a slightly more focused manner for the ones pertinent to my grandfather in those particular years, his early years in, in Britain as, as a schoolboy, as a student, and the war years, which is, of course, what uh, Stephen was particularly interested in. And I think we managed to identify a few pictures that hadn't been used uh, previously uh, in the coverage of my grandfather, both as an airman and a golfer, which is princ principally how uh, you'd find references to him online or in articles. But I'd like to say one thing very quickly, having read most of the book, uh, I haven't had quite the time to finish it completely, but that's to say that my grandfather, of course, I was familiar with a lot of the stories uh, as a child and then uh, his autobiography. But I think it is particularly interesting to have this angle being researched so thoroughly and so effectively because it's his life and his experiences in the context of a far bigger social, political, and very interesting historical era for both Britain and India. So I have really enjoyed this book very, very much, both in terms of the quality of the writing and the content. Uh, you mentioned uh, his photos playing golf. I think it's even there in the in the book. It's that iconic photo of him. Uh, of, of is, is he playing or somebody he knows very well is, is hitting a tee shot? And then uh, I think it's there even in the book. Is, is it there, Stephen? Uh, yeah, indeed it is. Yeah, it was uh, one of those that Sancha very kindly recommended. And um, yeah, those photographs were taken in the 1920s when he returned to um, he returned to Oxford to undertake the probationary year for the Indian Civil Service. And he and um, his new bride, Prakash, they went on a, a sort of tour of Britain waiting to begin at Oxford. And uh, I think they were a golfing sensation, actually. On the on the greens of uh, of Britain, uh, and I, I think it's quite fascinating that you have these photos stored, uh, Santia, for nearly a century now. Uh, it's quite yes. remarkable now. All of us can see it and just yeah. visually recreate history. I think that's pretty mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, for our viewers, why why don't both of you tell us one or two of the most inspirational or important instances from Hardit's service? Uh, during the war that the book dives into, perhaps what took place uh, over Flanders in 1917? Whoever would like to begin. Go Let ahead, Stephen. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think, I think that's um, hard it Singh would have said that um, his combat experience over Flanders, over Passchendaele, as it's known, um, was a formative part of his life. Um, yeah, I think um, I think that formative moment over Flanders in October of 1917 uh, during the Battle of Passchendaele, as it became known, uh, was hugely important in Hardit Singh's life. Um, I think it's it's very easy to, from a 21st century perspective, to lose just the sheer sense of terror that these men had to undertake throughout their training and then into combat. Um, even the greatest of the uh, the fight races of the First World War would often suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. The, the, the fact of having to constantly repeat going back into the air and facing a traumatic combat experience. Even if you're in your, young, in your early 20s and you're doing it again and again, many of them were either killed or suffered terrible mental trauma. And... Hardit Singh, he sort of conveys a little bit of that in his in his autobiography, but it's it's one of those that is often laid dormant with the veterans. They don't want to talk about that, and I think he, Hardit Singh gives a hint of his impact that it had on him in believing that um, it was formative in the sense that. Once you've been through aerial combat of that nature, it puts the rest of your life in perspective. And I think that in combination with his, his very strong faith 
stood him in good stead for the rest of his life. I think there's a quote at the end of the book where he says, uh, where, where, where you quote him, I think. Is that from a getter or where's that from where he says that? Yeah, indeed. That, yes, I, uh, that you go when your time comes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think that was an important moment. Yeah. Uh, Santia, would you like to add to that? Well, I'm just thinking, of course, I remember him as my grandfather. So I remember, I remember the aspects of his personality that were that are clear in the book that remain steady throughout his life. The charm, the warmth, the humor. Um, definitely also even at a young age, that transmission of the notion of faith, a quiet, confident. Um, it was about integrity, about courage. Um, and about justice, about fairness, which went on uh, through his diplomatic service as well. But what strikes me, re, sort of re-going into his life, the parts, of course, that I didn't wasn't familiar with directly, but through the book, is the youth, the, how very young all these men were. And that often when we speak about uh, world, the world war, one for one thing, I think a lot of people amalgamate the two and actually thinking about World War II when it comes to uh, the Air Force, uh, the Royal Air Force, uh, pilots, etc., pilot, fighter pilots. So one is with a world which continues to know wars today, soldiers of all kinds, officers and infantry and airmen, they are so, so very young. You're talking about just about into your 20s. So the first thing is that of my grandfather taking that uh, 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 journey on, on a ship on his own at the age of 14. Uh, the fact that later my grandmother was only 15 when she was married and took that uh, same uh, ship journey across to, to England. So when you're talking about her playing, uh, learning and playing golf, I mean, she's what, 16? Uh, and probably had some familiarity with English, but not much. But coming back to my grandfather, how very young he was going to England, those years of schooling, and how quickly into the war he would have had that combination of the fearlessness immortality of a very young man, of it's the adventure, it's the romance. I mean, it's, you know, the knight in shining armor up in the skies. It was the adventure of it, I think, that drew him very much, as well as that song, strong sense of, um, of uh, patriotism, but representing India, then under British imperial uh, rule, but representing a Great Britain of the friends he had made by, by then, the people he had come into contact to, and the the wonderful nature of those friendships. So that's what he was fighting for. He was fighting for, you know, the freedoms uh, and the liberty of, tho of those people, of, of, of society. It wasn't politics at that point. And he was so young. And I think his exposure first as a, as a French uh, Red Cross ambulance driver is when he would have first started to really see for himself with all those wounded soldiers coming back for treatment, he would have actually seen and being on the front to retrieve those soldiers at certain points, he would have started to see what the war really was about. Because while Shashi Tharoor very kindly does the foreword of this book, and he uh, refers to my grandfather along with, you know, those 740,000 the loss of life of, of Indian soldiers during the First World War. Um, my grandfather had that great fortune and luxury of quite literary, literally and metaphorically flying above it. He was not in the trenches. That's not to say he didn't suffer um, psychologically from it because the truth of the matter is he never spoke about the war to us. There were no war stories. The stories we grew up on were, uh, were, were later on in his I ICS, um, ICS service, later on in India, he was still a young man, but the war is not something that was to be recounted lightly. He was a great storyteller, but it wasn't about the war. Perhaps. Can I just, can I, oh, pardon of me. Course. I'll right, just come in on that. that just uh, pick up on something that Bantia has said. Um, I, I came across a wonderful interview with your with your grandfather, and um, the interviewer conducted twenty five minutes interview with him, 
And it was only right at the very end that she realized that he was a First World War pilot and not a Second World War pilot. And I could see once she got over the look of horror in terms of the interview questions that she'd put to him previously, there was a real sense of awe that here was someone going back, you know, 80 years as it was then. And uh, there was a real reverence that, that came into the interview. But there was a lovely moment she expresses that. Oh, you're a First World War pilot. And that was Which a really very, interesting moment. In, in a very simple physical illustration of that, the incident, rather large, of the 400 bullets having riddled the 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 aircraft he he crashed landed and survived in. It was a camel. Two, the aircraft was a camel stop with. Is that what it was? It was. It would have been a camel stop with, I think, at that point. Uh, and he survived that with two bullets in his leg for the rest of his life. But four hundred bullets is to remember that that aircraft was wood and canvas and wire. It wasn't metal sheet. So those bullets ripping through that. Canvas, wood, and wire, 400 bullets ripping through that, and he survives it. So the fact that he survived alone was a story in itself. The fact that he was the only Indian pilot to have the life he did, to survive as long and live, to get to live the life he did, is extraordinary in itself. Since uh, you both just alluded to his faith and how that was essential, uh, an essential part of his life, um, I'd like to ask both of you to to what extent did sort of uh, his faith Sikhism guide him in his service or his life after that? Because there are a lot of mentions about it in the book. I think there are a lot of mentions because it was fundamental. I think it was introduced in such a strong, um, important way in his life before leaving Rawalpindi through his his mother's faith, Sant Atar Singh, his exposure to and I, I, every time I speak of the Sikh faith, I always distinguish between um, somebody who is religious and someone who has faith, because I do think that there is a distinction between the two. And my grandfather most definitely had faith. And I think that was core to him. And I think it informed everything he did. And I like the fact that th that did not for a minute make him a boring man or a stodgy man. He was full of humor. I think he had a he had quite a prankster nature. I think he quite probably did uh, was involved in the teapot incident. Uh, he he loved a good time. He was a very social person. Uh, and the fact that he had so many friends can only uh, be that that he wasn't at all uh, preachy or, or anything like that. But he had that faith that I think carried him through that he paid attention to. He lived his life by it in terms of his own behavior, his uh, interactions with the other, other people. That was always good, true, honest, straight, and informed his own behavior uh, and the limits of what he would or would not do. Um, and I think that I love the fact that this book is about something that is over two uh, over a hundred years ago, and I find reading it today in a contemporary context, I find it still relevant. That I I like that my I find my grandfather inspirational. He was a lovely, lovely human being to me as a grandfather. He was also an exceptional human being by by what he did in his life, who he was. But that is also a matter of circumstance. But he happened to also be a really good human being. So I love the fact that he's an inspirational person with both the circumstances of his life and how he chose to live it. Stephen, would you just want to come in on the faith question? Yeah, I just think he, one of the things that comes across, as Sanchez says, is that he, he carried his faith light, lightly on the surface. It was the guiding those were the guiding principles. The principles of the Sikhism were the guiding principles of his life. But in the world in which he was existing during the First World War, he, he carried it lightly. And, and that endeared those to him. And, and I think that many of the people around him were in awe of him because of, because of those things. They knew that he had a faith, but he carried it lightly and that those principles guided him in that war service. So, yeah. I think it also. Sorry, I think I think it is one of the reasons um, 
he survived his experiences of the war in the manner in which he did, that it affected him deeply, but none of it made him bitter or angry or resentful or traumatized him in, an, in a negative way. I mean, he channeled those things into good things in his life. And I think that's only whatever he learned as a child. Uh, and it must have been really strong to carry him through those 10 years on his own as a boy in, in, in England and through the rest of his life. Yeah, I guess we can view that the faith was like an essential guiding light in his life, but it wasn't sort of overtly there. It was there deep within, but not sort of, as you say, it's, it's, it's not in front of everyone for them to sort of see. Um, moving on, I'd like to ask, so basically um, the book looks into the difficulties Hagrid faced once he was in the UK and then once from Oxford when he tried to enlist into the British military during World War I, uh, all his sort of classmates, peers and juniors had enlisted, but he hadn't been able to. Uh, could you talk to us about that, Stephen, and how his uh, tutor helped him, his tutor at Oxford, how he helped him? Yeah. Um, if, you, if, you, um, if you came to Britain to enlist in the Indian Civil Service or into the legal profession, you could rise pretty high in those professions. That was not true within the British military. So if, you, if you look at the, the manual of military law as the, as the book explores, is that if you, um, if you were a person of colour, you were defined as either, quote, an alien or a native. And it was at the point at which he, Padit Singh, attempted to enlist four or five times. In some places that are very close to me, at Cowley Barracks in Oxford, Balliol itself was a recruitment centre during the First World War, enlisted 800 people in the first three weeks of the war, but not hard it sing. And that was because it was embedded into military law. And one of the, the key things that I found out about his service by looking at the archives, at the, um, at the India office archives at the British Library, was the degree to which he his case was going to be used personally by officials at the India office and also in the Royal Air Force to challenge that principle. Many officials believed that it was discriminatory, unjust, and those officials carry out um, a campaign led by the Secretary of State for India, Montague, which uh, it then comes to fruition with the uh, with some of the acts of 1918 and 1919, particularly the Chelmsford Montague reforms. And Hardit Singh is name checked in those some of those discussions at various times in 1918 and 1919 between the Viceroy and the, and the Secretary of State for India. But just going back to the challenges that he faced, his tutor. Um, was particularly annoyed, um, Fligger Urquhart was particularly annoyed by the fact that it looked like Hadit Singh would be enlisted, or there was a possibility he might be enlisted into the French Flying Force. The French had a, a rather more liberal approach of people of colour taking command in the French forces, and when Hardit Singh wrote back to um, to Sligar Urquhart at Balliol, he was so incensed that he wrote to, he, Urquhart wrote to David Henderson, who had led the Royal Flying Corps to war in 1914. And what was interesting, little things that I found, is that the two of them knew each other because they were trustees of the, of the Red Cross in London. So Hardit Singh has a connection with... Um, is this... Are the thing knowing um, who, Henderson, or are you saying uh, the tutor knew Henderson? The tutor, pardon me, yeah, the tutor, Urquhart, knows David Henderson. They are both trustees of the Red Cross in London. In fact, David Henderson, after the First World War, he leads the International Red Cross. He becomes the chair in 1920-21. Uh, but where it's appropriate to our story is that Urquhart... His connection with Hardit Singh then connects with David Henderson, and Hardit Singh is given an interview 
and is therefore enlisted. There's another part to that story, though, very briefly, which is that the door is already open because because of British losses over the Somme between July and November 1916, then head of the Royal Flying Corps, Lord Trenchard, writes to the cabinet led by Asquith, the British Prime Minister, and says, look, unless you can recruit more pilots, we're going to lose the war. It's as emphatic as that. We're going to lose the war. And officials at the India office, this is fascinating stuff for me, officials at the India office, they start a campaign whereby Indian pilots can be recruited. Many officials at the Royal Flying Corps know that many Indians actually have gone to the United States. They've gone to France to get flying certificates in the, in the embryonic world of, of flight. And um, as a result of that, five Indians, British subjects, but nevertheless Indians who are resident in the UK are enlisted during that window of November 1916 into March of 1917 and then the window is shut. And Hardit is one of those then? And Hardit Singh was, was one of those, yeah, indeed. And then the window closed, and then they are only recruited again, Indians are only recruited again late in 1918 as a result of the, Chen, uh, of the Montague Chelmsford reforms and one or two other forms that are going on. And also, and Britain again, is running short of pilots. So I guess that that's a good example of him being there at the right time. As, as you said, Santa, a lot of it was circumstantial. And I guess this is one great example of that. Well, as when Stephen um, contacted me, uh, as we spoke, essentially this was the key, the key area that was new, which uh, as Stephen suspected, and I, I believe it to be true, that my grandfather was not aware of clearly of these uh, direct communications between the top level of government of India, British government of India and, and the government in, in, uh, in the UK, that, that we're using him as a case study or as an example for and against. And that this was sort of a yo-yo situation or ping pong situation over a period of years where the political um, circumstances were dictating whether his case was going forward and might, like having a, a full commission was a possibility that might be seen through or would lose, lose momentum and be countered because of a new political situation. So it's quite fascinating reading through the book, chapter after chapter, as it evolves in the space of months or just a, a small number of years, where you're literally going from one scenario to the other, where Yes, commission, no commission, you know, from one page to the next. But so it's quite, quite exciting to read it from that perspective. But I'm quite sure my grandfather would have had absolutely no knowledge of this at the time. Specifically, given the sort of the levels at which this exchange was going on, the letters and probably the communiques, it was probably hard to know for anybody. What's absolutely. Going yeah. absolutely. But the fact that nobody's known about it or this, this particular um, sort of uh, political back and forth at that level that we're talking about it now, about a hundred years later, is also quite a conversation in terms of British rule in India, the end of British rule in India, Indian, Indian independence gaining momentum on all sorts of fronts. Um, it's quite fascinating to have this little case study of an individual's life and exactly who he was at the time he was, where he was, and what he happened to want to do, join the Air Force, all of this becomes, you know, in, interesting to, to politicians at, 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 at the state, at the top of state level. I just quickly want to say one thing about the racial notion in terms of how Britain was viewing um, officers of its dominions and the French might have been. The fact that my grandfather was exposed to officers of color from essentially North Africa uh, in France during the First World War and the attitude towards them both by the local population and uh, junior officers uh, of fully French origin uh, is very interesting, but I do think 
the attitude towards him specifically, I would put two tiny caveats on that. One is that India was uh, one of the subject nations under British imperial rule, and France was not that nation. France had other uh, areas of geographical areas under its rule, which these officers came, came under. So my grandfather, as an Indian, would not have had the same dynamic with French officers of color or, or, or not, and the French population as these, these other um, officers uh, in the French army would, would have, um, which I find is quite interesting. And the second thing I do think, having a turban on your head at that time and being a handsome, young, sick gentleman with the education he had, <laughs> fluent in English and in French, presenting well, he, he was a little bit of a dandy. He was a handsome, really handsome young man and always was, uh, and uh, you know, right up till the end, also plays into his experience uh, specific to him. I just think it's fascinating how one person's story and the way specifically you've told that Stephen fits into so many themes. There's the images of the empire, there's World War I and its history, and then there's now in today's time how you view and understand race. So I think it just the way it all ties in is marvelous, to be honest. Uh, and it's but, amazing just... that, sorry, go ahead, Stephen. Oh. Pardon me. Can I can I just add, add a little bit to that? There, there may yeah. be a spoiler here, um, Thancha. So you may want to you may want to close your ears here. If you've not no, got I've, to the I've end read of the I've read most of it. Okay, that's our great. viewers might get to know too much, but then. But go, <laughs> okay, I'll I'll not give too much away. But I, I think the other part of that of your earlier question about his ability to enlist, on the struggles therein, uh, relate to the fact that the First World War ends and. And Hardit Singh returns to Rawal Pindi ten years after um, after leaving. And what's fa what was fascinating to me, even more fascinating what we, than what we've been discussing already, was the fact that he he envisaged being a, a flying officer in the newly fledged Royal Air Force in India. And I've got, I'm certain that when he arrived back in Rawalpindi, that was his ambition. He was, he had um, friendly uh, officers, very high ranking officers in the RAF who were supporting that. And of course, what then happens is the fact that on the day that he's married, still with that ambition to join the RAF in India, the Jallianwalabagh massacre takes place on the day that he's married. And that triggers great, even greater correspondence because here you've got a well-qualified Royal Air Force Sikh lieutenant who's perfectly appropriate to go there, to go and fly, but of course that's not going to be possible. And, the, and, the, and it's at that point, from a, as, a, a, as a historian, that was absolutely fascinating. And I was hopping around in the, in the British Library with this fascination about what I was uncovering copious amounts of telegrams between Chelmsford and Montague name checking, name checking Hardit Singh Malik because here you've got the personification of India and Great Britain coming together in a war zone yeah, and, and, what to do, and what to do and what to do yeah, yeah I, I think the the point you're making about Jagya Wagabag, I think there's this part where you argue to the sort of a dualism he Hardit Singh Malik develops towards Britain, where he he enjoys its liberalism, but then is against the aspect of imperialism. Uh, I, I think you mentioned that in the book somewhere, Stephen. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. I think he's. I think I, I'm. I'm often asked, or I, I've been asked recently about how you know how did Hardit Singh rationalise. And, and, and Sancho will have, have views on this, uh, more, more intimate views on this than I have. But I do think that he viewed his service with Britain, both he, he valued the liberal aspects of it through his education. Um, he had, a, uh, as Sancho said, an appreciation of people having different beliefs and the rule of law, for example. Um, but on the other hand, he did not appreciate or value imperialist Britain. And the way that he, that was manifest in his relationships was that I think 
uh, this is an opinion based on the evidence that I've read, was that he, he, his personal relationships, he did not blame personal people. He had many British friends, but actually where blame lay for imperialism was at the political level. And I think that was the way that he rationalized it. So there was a sort of liberal imperialist separation, but also the personal and the political. Um, and also, just one other point I would make at, the, at this section is that it's really important not to view the evidence from a 21st century perspective. At the point when Hardit Singh has come to Britain, partition is almost 50 years away. And, you know, from our perspective today, the decisions that we might make now and the decisions that were made then are very different, very, very different. We have and, to be given and that's where historical wisdom lies in understanding decision making that could be made at the time. So before we, yeah. sorry, Sasanta, do you want to come in? Yes, no, I was, I was just going to say, I think that's why, uh, in those early years already, you see it, and it remained tr true for the rest of his life. My grandfather, I think, was never interested in politics, and he was never a politician. So I think that that's why, uh, as Stephen brought out his years in as a student, he was not an activist. He didn't get involved in any specific movements whilst being completely um, sympathetic to the cause of uh, India's desire to be free, or at least have at that time a home rule of self-governance. But he was not, I think that was just not his nature. He wasn't into politics. Um, he, I think in that sense that he was, I think he was a, a humanist. I think he had faith and he believed in people all kinds of people everywhere. It's the person that mattered, not the politics, which is why I think he was able to connect at every level of society in any country with anybody because it was about the human being in front of him. It didn't matter what their faith was, what their politics were, what their education was. It was with human beings. So I think that's why he had that kind of connection. And I think the non-political bent frame of mind he simply had, his character, that is also it, it, it colors how he behaves in these circumstances where he's frustrated about the administration. He's frustrated about, about um, structures that have been put in place that are artificial. So it's not about the people, it's not about the country. It's about those artificial structures, which would, still, which would be true today when one talks about systemic racism or anything else, right? You're talking about systems that sometimes ordinary people have absolutely nothing to do with and don't believe in. Um, before we run out of time, I want to ask one last question uh, to both of you. Uh, how do you feel the book fits into the larger theme of acknowledging the services of those from India and the colonies during World War I? Stephen? Well, okay. Oh, I uh, of the one and a half uh, million Indians who served the empire during the first world war there are very very few personal memoirs or accounts and then if that so that on its own would make Hardit Singh's story special enough the fact that he wrote an autobiography and others including uh, Somnath Sapru have written about him but the fact that he was an Indian who was living and working in Britain and then enlisted on that side, on the empire side, with the British armed forces, makes his story even more unique and, and I think more important because the voices of those who served for India during the First World War, they're often silent. And that's why I've been delighted to write this book. Santiago, what about you? No, I was simply going to bring it all the way back to the fact that he was born into, in some respects, an ordinary Punjabi family in Rawalpindi. So you are semi-provincial garrison town in, in, in a sense, very much, you know, you are in India, you're not in a cosmopolitan capital, you are in a Punjabi community, in the Mohallas, in, a, in your gullies, it's an ordinary Indian life. Yes, privileged but it's a very Indian life. 
with an exposure to British through the, uh, the civil lines part of Rawal Pindi and his father's interactions with that. And then it's his education. But the fact of the matter is that he's playing cricket, riding his horses across dusty fields. He's in Rawal Pindi. That's what grounded him as an Indian. That never, that never shook. So if you start with that and then his British experience through circumstance and through education, taking him all the way to, you know, golfing with, with kings, that's an incredible spectrum for one human being to have experienced in his lifetime. But I think the fact that he of where he starts allows him to stay steady. Like he followed that one word that I keep close to my heart of Chardikala. It's keeping very, very centered all through his life. Okay, for our viewers, could you just explain Chardikala in a in a, just in a brief sentence? Oh, I don't I don't speak Punjabi, so I'm going to get this lo- wrong, I think. But I think it's that having having faith. Uh, and being guided by uh, by your faith to be a, a, a good person uh, with strength and, and truth. So, um, thank you very much for that. Thank you for a great conversation, Stephen and Santhya. And that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, we hope people will read the book, imbibe it, imbibe it, and get inspired by Hargit Singh Marik's story and further even understand the role of Indians and those from the colonies during World War I and after. Thank you so much for joining us at the Print Soft Cover. And here's the book again. It's a wonderful book. I'd recommend it as his granddaughter. Recommend it to everybody. Absolutely. Thank Thank you you so much. Thank you so much.